Hi everyone, so um, I'm here with Nick Wilson on Bike Tours for the Wounded and I have Amy Clover here whose dad originally set up the charity. Amy, can you tell us a bit about it please? I can, so it's got a very long story short. Excuse the voice, I'm just getting over a bit of a cough. Um, my father, Darren Clover, fantastic man, um, had a very big aim based on one of his very good friends and a good, a good friend of mine, Mick who was um, diagnosed with Gulf War Syndrome and not given much time to live. And one of his um, wishes was to do Route 66. So um, my, my dad, Mick, and another friend went off and did it. And it was whilst doing that that dad realized that it was quite freeing, it was very therapeutic. Um, it gave people a chance to reflect and just get away from real life and challenge themselves, really. Um, so seventh year well it will be officially the fifth year but seven years of trialing roads hotels getting to know people making contacts and um, this is where we are now today we've taken over 300 people um, whether they're physically injured mentally struggling um, or wounded um, three of those people who have actually said that without the tour and uh, they don't feel they'd have had much purpose and, and wouldn't want it to have continued um, we have formed a massive family unit and continue to do events to fundraise predominantly for the CIC. So we're a community interest company, um, so we're 100% not for profit. So any funds that are raised or donated go directly to funding guys like the two in the back. Mm -hmm. Give us a wave! <laughs> <laughs> um, so we run four of these tours a year. We're always looking for riders um, that have the time and affordability to come out and carry one of these guys. And um, to say they're life-changing is, is an understatement. Um, but a huge shout out to Darren Clover, my dad. Masses and masses of effort gone into this, passion. And he never gives up and he will never ever let anyone down. And that's how we work and that's how we keep going. So if you want to know more, if you want to get involved, then um, come along and you're all welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Thank you. <laughs> Could you now give us a little intro into yes. um, the very special guest we met? Yes. So when Darren came out and did this tour years ago, um, he went for an apple pie because he likes his food <laughs> um, and happened to bump into a very special man called um, John Backer. Um, John Backer was awarded um, the Medal of Honour for quite a remarkable story um, which I won't go into detail about because I know Nick's actually got a recording of it um, but he's since every time we're out here come and, and shown his his support and appreciation to bike tours for the wounded he comes out and personally tells his story also hands out him a little medal of honor coins and really takes time to listen to the stories and give the advice that he feels he can um, it's always a highlight for the tour and I know that it touches a lot of people so please take the time to listen to the story because it's, it's really quite remarkable and thank you John for always being there we can't wait to get you over to the UK um, that's our aim for next year to get him over to one of our fundraising events so have a look I'm Pete Sacker, Specialist Sport Class US Army Company D, 1st Battalion, 12th Cavalry, 1st Cavalry Division one of them, the unit was pinned down by the enemy for hours, ankle deep in red clay. Backer had just bent over to set up his recoilless rifle when he heard the snapping sound of a sniper's bullet pass right over his back. On the morning of February the 10th, after being in the bush for almost a month, Backer's company returned to its base. The men were to have a few days rest before going out again. But late that afternoon, they and the rifle platoon were ordered to set up on the night ambush and were helicoptered to a target at dusk. The Americans established a position near a trail and placed warning devices, tripwires connected to Claymore mines on either end of it that would alert them of their presence of the enemy. When an eight-man patrol from the rifle platoon went out to investigate mine explosion, it soon came under attack from the enemy soldiers concealed along the trail. Backer sprinting through heavy fire with his recoilless rifle to the aid of this patrol, had just set up the firing position for his weapon and fired one round when a grenade landed close by. He would remember later thinking, do I pick it up? Do I run? 
Then he ripped off his helmet, put it over the grenade, and covered it with his body. The grenade exploded, and several GIs picked Backer up and carried him to the shelter of a tree. Leaning against the trunk, he felt no pain, although when looked down at his stomach, he could see his intestines poking out of his uniform. He remembers wondering his mother, whom he called that morning and told that he would remain in the rear for a few days, would be angry with him. The noise of the battle raging all around him seemed distant, and the movement of the comrades seemed to be slow motion. With death very near, back <coughs> he was holding the arms of an angel. Peaceful, gentle moments. It was close to two hours before Backer was carried to the landing zone and helicoptered out. On the flight back to base, he gripped the hand of another wounded soldier, then began hemorrhaging and lost consciousness. After being treated in long bin for a week, he was sent to hospital in Japan. His mother told he may not recover, may not survive. Flew to his bedside, stayed with him for a few weeks, then accompanied him back to the States in late April. Over the next several months, he continued to improve, although he wound up in intensive care on two occasions. John Backer was out of the army, starting college when he was informed that he would receive the Medal of Honor from President Richard Nixon, who presented it to him at the White House on June the 15th, 1971. Backer then returned to Vietnam in 1990 and worked for two months alongside former enemy soldiers to build the United States Vietnam Friendship Clinic. John Backer, MOH. you're there and no pain never you know just so peaceful the dying moments and they have an organization snowball express gary sinise you know the movie star he heads it up now and every year i think about 15 years they gather about 2,000 family members with lots moms and dads or sons and daughters in iraq and afghanistan and i meet some of them on the plane or wherever you know together and going to be in Orlando this year in December. I hope I get to be a volunteer. But they don't really know how they lost their loved ones, and I tell them about those dying moments, and it's like your whole life flashes before you, and you see your family right instantly, and it gives them a peace, and just knowing maybe that have, that happened. Uh, met some beautiful people, and when I came in the Medal of Honor Society, I just... Uh, lost my mom, she was 46. I buried her and I came back for Nixon's second inauguration to Washington, D.C. They had 365 living then, mostly six World War I guys, and I was the youngest for about a year and a half. Get a picture of the youngest with the oldest. Now, all the old timers have befriended me, they're just, they're all gone, most of them. And there's about 80 maybe living now, and I'm trying to get these new guys from Iraq and Afghanistan, you guys need to get out of your stuff and be a part of Snowball. Meet the families who lost moms and dads. And it's a wonderful organization. Then when you're with the kids four days after a while, they all gang up. They want you to come home and substitute be their grandpa or father. But I usually, I get addresses and I get pies from Debbie at Apple Alley and I send them to the Snowball family. But I, I, I moved to San Diego three years ago, and I miss, I come up and I miss it, not living up here again, but I'll always make a visit and irritate the neighbors and <laughs> get pies. And, oh, and this is Jojo, he, he keeps me from having seizures, so you get that malmute, and he'll, he'll be right there in your face when you get those orders. I've met some beautiful people, and and I guess when you connect with somebody, you, you connect for life. Like my friend Art James, I'm holding his hand on the helicopter. I lived with him and his family in Maryland. He had a farm, and we'd farm together. Now he's, he's not doing good. I don't hear from him. But his family and his grandkids stay in touch with me, and they say, John, come on out and be a part of us. Get with Dad again. And, I'm hoping that you know I'll uh, go out to Maryland again at the end of summer and I'll spend time with them. 
picked blueberries for the farmer's market, and had, then we had a little fellow, a dwarf, who would work with us picking blueberries and bring them to the, sell them to the people in Washington, D.C. And, and he's always been my best friend, and he always will be, and, and I'm glad his kids stay in contact with me. And going back to Vietnam, uh, I, I captured a North Vietnamese soldier Christmas morning sitting on a bunker. It was a most beautiful Christmas gift that I ever had. And if I didn't capture him, I would have walked us into an ambush, and I would have got. If you do that, you and if I had, I survived. You know, you live with that guilt the rest of your life, and you know people got blown away. But it was just I know God was there, and end up taking him alive. And going back 19 October, September, and October. That fellow was at the work site, work site when we were building the American Vietnamese Friendship Clinic. The Vietnamese loved us coming back, coming back and being a part of what, build what we destroyed through the bombs. And, and some of the Americans that stayed over there, they didn't want to come back home. They never trusted anybody from the government to give an account. And, and there were stories, there was a, a book, Kiss the Boys Goodbye, if they see an American you know, have our people shoot them, take them out, you know. The horrors that our governments do on us, it's so sad. But anyway, uh, I know I'm, we had generals like Colin Powell and Norman Schwarzkopf and Peter Pace, and they were in the foxholes and in the jungles with us when they were captains and lieutenants, and they made four-star generals. These generals nowadays, they've never out there in the front lines with, with the guys in Iraq or Afghanistan. Or, and they're making their motivational speeches and they're not saying nothing. You never hear of a wounded guy who speak in, you know, Memorial Day or Veterans Day. But, but at least great people in our society and I met a lot of wonderful people and and I got a I made amends with my daughter. I was wasn't in her life for fifteen years and she may get married soon, so and I'm good friends with her and her mom and she comes out and visits from Massachusetts, so I guess I finish what I'm saying long before I quit talking. <laughs> John's got some coins here in the middle of one of the coins, please. I don't know how many he's got, one for everybody actually, but if not... Um, mm -hmm. There's a, a Bible verse on Luke 15 20 about the prodigal son coming back to the Heavenly Father, so it's not here.